Good morning. How are y'all? We're going to start out with some great songs this morning. If y'all please stand, if you're able to, we certainly appreciate it. Vow, hand spreading like a wildfire in my heart. Sunday morning, hallelujah, lasting all week long. We're going to do a redo. My technical stuff is not working, so just give me just a second. Much better. There's revival. It's spreading like a wildfire in my heart. Sunday morning, hallelujah, it's lasting all week long. Can you hear it? Can you feel it? It's the rhythm of a gospel song. Won't you choose it? You can lose it. Glad y'all are here. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Let us join our hearts in a word of prayer this morning. Father God, we come to you. We look to you as creator, as redeemer, as the source of our salvation and the source of our our joy. God, as we worship you this morning, we pray that uh, our hearts will honor you, that we will lift our hearts to you, that we will focus on you and you alone, God. As we worship you, let us glorify you. Let us lift your name up this morning above the name above all names as the King of kings, the Lord of lords. God, we pray that our worship will be holy and righteous to you this morning, that it will be pure 
and that you will be blessed and honored by it. As we gather this morning for worship, God, we thank you for everything that you've given us. We thank you for the peace and the joy and the, the, the safety that we've all experienced during these times, Lord. And God, we, we thank you and we love you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said... Amen. Y'all may be seated. Good morning, everybody. We're glad everybody's here. Thank y'all for joining us. Uh, for those of you that are online, welcome. Thank you for taking time out of your Sunday morning to uh, worship with us. Let everybody know that you're worshiping with us, whether it be uh, you know through uh, through Facebook or on our YouTube channel. Uh, you know, share this, like it. Let everybody know. Start a watch party. Invite people over, say, hey, come worship with me this morning. And, uh, you know, we, let's uh, lift the name of the Lord up this morning. Uh, just a few announcements before we uh, continue to worship. Uh, we do have Rewind Discipleship Groups. We have one that meets at uh, 9.15 on Sunday morning. Please consider joining us. Come gather fellowship grow together as we uh, dive deeper into the uh, sermon material the week before. Uh, please uh, consider joining us with that. Uh, tonight at 6 o'clock, we're going to have uh, a, an adult Bible study over in the Fellowship Hall. That will also be online as well if you can't uh, join us physically. We're going to be journeying through the book of, the Re book of Revelation uh, through the coming months. Uh, just to kind of see what, uh, what scripture uh, teaches us, how we can apply it to our lives, and how we can live a God-honoring, uh, glorifying life as we, uh, as we journey through that. Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday is a, uh, a day of fasting and prayer, if you so choose. If you like to fast, uh, you have health issues, please check with your, uh, your health care provider and, and tell them what you're doing and uh, let them know and, and get some pointers to stay healthy, but trust in God as well. If you have any prayer requests in that area, please don't, don't hesitate. Reach out to us. You can send us a message through Facebook. You can send us an email. You can go online to our website, www.cbc-corpus.com. You can fill out a guest connection form there. Let us know you joined us for worship, but you can share us with us your prayer request. Uh, we'd like to meet. Uh, we'll meet at uh, Tuesday, 6 o'clock here. We do a little lesson through study of what prayer looks like, um, how we can apply it in our lives, and how we join our hearts together as a group uh, to, uh, to God. So consider uh, participating in that as well. We've got lots of prayer requests right now uh, for those of you here in person. There's a prayer list uh, back on the, uh, uh, the, the table back there with uh, the, the sermon notes. So uh, pick one of those up. If you can't make it on Tuesday night, please spend a few moments from uh, during the course of the day, and especially at 6 o'clock, uh, stop what you're doing, lift up prayers to God, and uh, we pray that uh, he'll be uh, glorified through that. Um, our community, uh, our nation, we all need to be unified right now. And uh, that's, uh, you know, that's the biggest prayer. That's the biggest driving prayer. So as we continue to worship this morning, please, if you're able to stand, let us stand. And uh, Michael and Julian will lead us in worship. Joy we share as we take. 
I'd stay in the garden with him Though the night around me be falling He bids me go through the voice of woe His voice to me is calling And he walks with me and he talks with me and tells me I am his own and the joy we share as a there none other has ever known and the joy we share as a there none other has ever As we uh, face uncertain times, the Bible says to let the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds as we go through every day, as we uh, face the unknowns and the uncertainties. Let, it, let, us, let us pray for peace for our lives, for the life of this community, the life of this nation. As we join our hearts, God, we lift up to you. We lift up our hearts. We yearn for peace. We yearn for unity, God. Lord, we, we pray that you will draw us closer to you, that you will give us the courage and the confidence to spread the gospel through our community, that we can grasp the unification that is found only through the gospel of Jesus Christ, Lord. And we pray that the peace that you have that passes all of our comprehension, that goes beyond anything we could ever imagine, God, we pray that you will pour out that peace on us, on our lives, on our families, on our community, on this nation. God, we pray for our leaders. We ask that you guide them, Lord. And if they don't know you, Lord, draw them closer to you that they can be unified under the banner of the gospel, Lord. God, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the forgiveness that we find at the foot of the cross. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When peace like a river attendeth my way When so We 
side The clouds be rolled back As a scroll The trump shall resound And the Lord shall descend Even so it is well with my soul it is well with my soul it is well it is Saying that one really pretty. Thou number one, it always be me. Thou I. as of the day just you come into our hearts anything that's blocking us or hindering us God we just ask that you remove that Father speak to us as only you can Father we thank you for Pastor Randy we thank you for the things that you have brought to him to bring to us we just ask that in those weeks to come there's so many uncertain things going on in our lives in the world that you just continue to bless us and show us what you have in store. Because ultimately, God, we know it's only you that's in control. Yes. So 
with any fears or things that we're concerned or worried about, Father, we just need to lay at your feet because they're not for us to worry about. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Y'all may be seated. As the uh, house lights start to come back up, uh, if the youngsters under the age of 10, uh, they can come grab a cup. If you've got any spare change, cushion change, ashtray change, uh, pocket change, folding money, whatever you got, uh, we're collecting an offering for the South Texas Children's Home. Uh, we uh, uh, send that on to the Stitch Ministries, their family reconciliation ministry here in the Coastal Bend area. Based out of Beeville, they have a group home up in Beeville where they uh, help kids uh, get placed for foster care. Uh, in the, they they kind of provide transition assistance for them, uh, for the kids that uh, are in the middle of the transition between family and, and foster care. They, uh, they house them up there in Beeville. Here in Corpus, they have a uh, family... Uh, uh, counseling ministry. Uh, if you need to uh, connect with uh, services for that, let me know. Uh, we can uh, we can get you connected with that. Uh, you can also go to their website. Uh, their website is not South Texas Children's Home Ministries. It's STCHM. So if you remember, South Texas Children's Home Ministry, STCHM.org. Uh, you can go on there. You can look at their, their family counseling, what they offer there, uh, their faith and finance program, and their uh, Jobs for Life program. Jobs for Life is a, is a pretty good growing program uh, here in the area. They, they help people that are transitioning between jobs. Uh, they help resource them with clothes for interviews, help them get their resumes together, uh, help them get... Uh, 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 skills developed for interviews because not everybody is uh, is good at being interviewed or good at uh, actually uh, I'm not one of those I don't like interviews and uh, they they're very nerve wracking so they help you get uh, get some experience in uh, practicing for interviews things like that so if you need help with any of that uh, please let us know reach out to us we'll be happy to get you connected with Stitch Ministries. Uh, through that uh, powerful, powerful partner resource that we have here, uh, among other things. If you check our Facebook page, I'm trying to put up every week uh, video highlights of some of the ministries that we cooperate with, like the North American Missions Board, International Missions Board, Southern Baptist of Texas Convention, uh, things like that as they pop up. But I also want to push uh, world mission work. You know, when, when we have like Annie Armstrong come up, Lottie Moon, uh, things like that, kind of showing you what they do so we can see where our, uh, when you support the work of this ministry here, where uh, a portion of what you give to us goes on to help uh, entities like the International Missions Board, North American Missions Board, and the uh, Southern Baptist of Texas uh, Convention. So uh, if, you, if you need any more information about any of those, uh, maybe God's put a call on your life to be a, a, a uh, we used to call them, they called it the Home Mission Board. That's, that's where I default, but the North American Mission Board. Uh, if, 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 you know, maybe God's calling you to be a church planner or God's calling you to uh, uh, reach out to people, uh, an unreached people group, maybe here in the United States, maybe across the world, um, let, it, let us know so we can get you connected with those resources um, and uh, get, you, uh, uh, get you into where God has called you to serve. So, Speaking of serving, as we move into uh, the uh, Bible study time, worship uh, sermon time, uh, we're going to be in Mark chapter 10 this morning. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open them up. Now, if you don't have a physical Bible, you can turn it on. Uh, we're going to be in Mark chapter 10. We're going to be in the latter part of Mark chapter 10. But when we talk about service, service carries a lot of meaning with it, right? We talk about... Uh, we speak of the worship service or a wedding service or a funeral service in, in that uh, aspect. Maybe you take your car to get a service, right? But service can also be a military term. I'm, I'm, I'm enlisting in the service, right? And when we do that, when, when somebody does that, they are giving up their rights, their decision-making uh, ability to have a life that is, that is laid out for them uh, they're, they're giving everything they've got to service for their country. And, and when, you, when you enlist in the military, you're, you're giving your time, your, your rights, you're, you're at the direction of, uh, of the, the 
people above you, but, but your desires as well, where your desires become the desires and the focus of the nation and what is better for the nation as a whole. So when we offer our lives to God, we turn our lives over in service to him. We, and over, over time, his priorities become our priorities. His desires become our desires. And, and our movements become his movements. As, as we move through life, the, as days go on, our, our direction is more and more directed by God. We, we turn our lives over to be used by God. <clears throat> and in our text this morning... I want us to see what true service, true greatness, what, what that demands when we give our lives to God and, and how we put that into practice for the glory of God. And we're going to be in Mark chapter 10, and I'm not going to read the whole, the whole passage. It's quite a lengthy passage, but the, the gospel of Mark here, we're going to see as we delve into the later chapters of, of Mark that it's going to... The action has already been fast-paced. I mean, in 10 chapters, Mark squeezed in three years of Jesus' ministry. And in the, in the next chapter, once we get into chapter 11, and uh, uh, we're going to see that the, that the rest of the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark, focuses on the last week of Jesus' life. And, and, and Mark spends about six chapters uh, focusing on each chapter focusing on one particular day in the last week of Jesus' life. But, but what we see here is that Jesus has set his face to go to Jerusalem. He knows what lies ahead. And, and as they're, they're walking on this, the, uh, they're, they're on their way to Jerusalem. And uh, Jesus is going to face the most difficult time in his, in his earthly ministry here. But Jesus moves into a teaching moment with this. And we, we're going to see this, this powerful picture uh, of what true greatness looks like in the life of the believer. And this is, this is what Jesus is kind of regrouping the, the disciples' focus back to. But I want to show you this, this first thing this morning. With, with Jesus' teaching, that Jesus sets the example for us. As they're walking on the road here, Jesus told the disciples, and this is going to be the third time that he tells them about his coming crucifixion. He says that the, that the Son of Man is going to be uh, handed over to the, the, chief priest, the chief priests and scribes, uh, and he's going to be betrayed, and then he's going to face a lot of uh, horrific things here. But Jesus knew that the cross was the only way out. There was no other way. He understood this. And, and uh, one of the gospels, and I don't remember where it is, but, but as this, this crucial turning point in Jesus' ministry, he's, the, the gospel writer says, Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. And this is not just some, oh, look, there's Jerusalem. No, Jesus, this, this shows Jesus' determination to fulfill God's will at any cost. And I think that's a powerful, powerful picture for us. But we, we saw a couple of weeks ago here that, that this story, like I said, this is the third time that, that Jesus has told about his crucifixion. But, but we're going to see when we saw a couple of weeks ago, the first time Jesus told about it, Peter said, yeah, right, not you. And, and so we, we see that they really didn't understand Jesus' mission. They didn't understand his purpose. But as, it, as Jesus is teaching the disciples what's going to happen here, every time he told the story, he added a little more to each retelling. The first time he just said that the chief priests and scribes are going to mock him and, and scorn him and, you know, Jesus, the, the son of man is going to die. He's going to be uh, crucified. He's going to be buried and he's going to rise again on the third day. That's when they had that tense interaction with Peter. The second time he adds to the story, he says the son of man is going to be betrayed into the hands of the Pharisees and the scribes. So the, the idea of betrayal there is, is a close personal 
associate is going to hand them over. And we're going to see later on, Judas will betray Jesus and, and sell him out. But then when he comes into this one here, when he comes into this one here, we see verses uh, 33 and 34 here where, where Jesus, Jesus tells uh, what he says, where he says there, uh, verse 33 in Matthew chapter 10, he says, see, we are going up to Jerusalem. The son of man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles and they will mock him, spit on him, flog him and kill him. And he will rise after three days. Before we dig into the text anymore, I want to I pray for a minute. Let's, let's stop for a moment and pray. God, we, we pray that, that we can see your example through this. Lord, we, we pray that we can set our faces towards your will. That we can look to you and understand what your word says. God, teach us, Lord. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. For the largest part of Jesus' ministry here, he, he had been harassed by the scribes and the Pharisees. They were the main antagonist throughout Jesus' ministry. Every time Jesus is doing something, they're out there looking for fault in what he's doing. And they're building up this list of evidence to be able to take to the council, the Sanhedrin, so they can accuse Jesus and, and find a way to put him to death. And we're going to see that shortly after this, that, that Jesus is going to uh, go see his uh, uh, friends, uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, except Lazarus is not there. Lazarus died. Jesus shows up, raises him from the dead, and that was it. That, that was the defining moment where, where the Pharisees and scribes said, no, we've got to get rid of this guy. We have to do something. And so, so Jesus and Lazarus then became marked men. They were going to uh, arrest, uh, arrest them and ultimately kill them. But we, we see here that Jesus' life is not going to get any easier. And when, when we look at this, we see that Jesus is determined to follow God's will. No matter what, later on, the, later on in this week, Jesus is going to have his last meal with his disciples and he's going to go into his quiet prayer time. And he's going to go into the garden and he's under so much stress knowing what he's facing that he, he literally starts sweating blood, but he falls on his face and he tells God, he says, God, if there's any other way I don't want to face your wrath, but if there's any other way, let it happen. But at the end of the day, I will follow exactly where you lead me, no matter what the cost. Jesus knew what that was going to entail, and he told him there. He says there's going to be a flogging. They're going to be spitting. They're going to be mocking. They're going to kill me. Right? He understood what was coming and he knew the pain and the agony and the suffering that endured. And what, what does this mean for us? This is Jesus' example. What does this mean for us? Right, We have to take Jesus' example very, very seriously. We this, this is not just some cool story with a good upstanding guy who, did, who always did the right thing. This is, this is Jesus Christ. This is the son of God that stepped down from his glory and became a fragile human being and he suffered and he died and he lived a life of perfection. Now, I know most of us are probably sitting there, well, we, we lose it at that point, right? We, we lose it at that, that point of, I can't live life like Jesus. But the truth is, is we can Jesus says that you can you you hold tight to me and you will do exactly what I did. You will live life like I lived. He says if you abide in me and you don't stray from me, you can live life like I did. Right? So Jesus is our example and, and when we see that he's going through this uncertain time. He's going through this time of literally sheer emotional torture for him. And he sets his face to the end goal because he tells his disciples, he's like, see, we're going to the place that I'm going to be killed at. 
And the disciples, they may have argued, well, why would you want to do that? I mean, you're, you're doing a lot of good things. You're doing a lot of good things out here in the backwater towns. Why don't you just hang out here for a little while? All of that will settle down. Those guys will, you know, move on. They'll get old. They'll retire, you know, whatever the case may be. But, but Jesus is our example, and, and he said many, many times, Throughout the course of the gospel, he says, if you want to follow me, it's going to require a lot of sacrifice. It's going to require suffering. It's going to require humiliation. It's going to require you getting in uncomfortable circumstances. It's going to require you doing things that you are not comfortable with. And you must daily take up your cross and follow me if you want to follow me. Jesus was so focused here on his mission as being the example He had just told a rich man earlier, before they started out on this journey, this rich man comes up to Jesus. He says, what do I got to do to, you know, he's like, I followed the law. He's like, well, you've done well. He's like, but if you want to be my disciple and if you really want to connect with God, you've got to get up, you've got to get up everything, your money, your car, your house, your, your, uh, you know, big screen TV. Whatever the case may be. And and the rich man, he leaves away. He's like, oh, I don't know if I could do that. Right? And Jesus says, we must deny ourselves. This is my example. Jesus lived a life of denial. And not necessarily like that denial is not just a river in Egypt. You know, denying that nothing's really going to happen. Jesus knew what was going to happen. He says, I'm fixing to die. And I'm going straight in to the belly of the beast, if you will. He said, I'm going to face this head on. And he tells us, this is my example to follow. You need to face whatever God has called you head on. We have to take Jesus' example very seriously. And he, he, was, he was so focused on his mission, nothing was going to deter him. Now, to be sure... The temptation to walk away from this was very, very easy. It was, it was very, very in his face, right? When Peter told him, oh, Jesus, far be it from you to, to have to suffer and die. You're the king of the world, right? It was, it was very easy to get caught up in that. I'm the creator of the world. The world doesn't exist without me. I don't need to do this. It it was really easy to get caught up in that. That was the temptation. And and I'm sure probably along the way, you know, when Jesus says, I'm going to die, I'm sure somebody, somebody somewhere had to tell Jesus, are you really sure you want to do this? Do you really think you need to do this? Because that's what our friends do, right? They try to talk us out of things that don't really make a whole lot of sense. You know, like when you're standing on the edge of the roof of the house saying, hey, y'all watch this. And and you got your friends over there. Do you really think that's a smart decision? Sure, why not? It looks fun. I'm going to jump from the roof into the pool. Who cares, right? But but that, and, and Jesus blocks out what they're saying. And he's leading the way because as a, a discipler, he would walk ahead of the group. He would lead the way. And Jesus is setting example after example after example for these people. And there was no turning back at this point. Like the the die was cast. Like things are in motion. There was only one way out of this. And that was to go to Jerusalem, be accepted as Messiah, recognized as Messiah by the people. And then turn around within the same few days, be rejected by the very same people that accepted him. To be mocked, to be, have his, have his beard plucked. I'm not going to do that. That hurts. Right? Why would I do that? Right? They, he, he's going to be, have his beard plucked. A crown of thorns shoved into his head. Right? He's going to be scourged. Meat hanging off of his bones. Why would anybody want to do that? It doesn't make sense. Right? But Jesus was so set. So set in what, what God had called him to do that there was no turning back. So what does that mean for us? Let's put this into application real quick. We need to sacrifice our personal desires on the altar of service. Sacrifice personal desires on the altar of service. So in order to follow Jesus' example, we have to be wholly and completely committed to following God's plan just as Jesus was. 
So that means that we have to lay our lives down. Not necessarily in a physical, but we have to be willing to lay our lives down should that be called of us. Right? That's what scripture says. And, you know, we have to be willing to give our lives for the gospel should the need arise or should the situation warrant. But, but not only that, that, that our lives, when we give it to God, is no longer ours to do with as we please. Our body is no longer to do with as we please. And I have a hard time when I sit down at the dinner table remembering this. I'm just saying, Romans 12.1. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. How do we live a life of worship? We give everything we have over to God. And some of you are probably struggling with this. Well, there's certain things in my life I don't want to let go. We can't be true followers. Jesus is very clear about this. We can't be true followers if we're not willing to sacrifice all of our personal desires on the altar of service to God. That's, that's what God calls. And he says the cost is high. You want to follow me? You, you cannot put anything in front of me. Family, friends, husband, wife, children, job. Nothing can override God's desire for your life. That's taking up the cross daily. We can't let anything get in our way. We have to set our faces to service to God. We have to willingly lay all of our lives down, lay all claim of our life down. I don't own my life anymore. You don't own your life anymore. It belongs to God. You were bought with a price, and that price was the blood of God's only son, Jesus Christ, that suffered and died on your behalf, right? And so when we, when we understand that and when we begin constantly laying our lives down daily, every day, every moment, right, we have to be aware or beware of selfish motivations. We have to be aware of selfish motivations, right? Watch as we move on into this text. Almost immediately after that, Jesus had told the disciples, he's like, hey, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to die, but I'm going to rise again, right? And then uh, look, look what happens. I, I kind of chuckle. But Look in verse 35 there. Almost immediately after Jesus said this, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, approached him and said, Teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask. That was pretty audacious, wasn't it? They, they go up to him and say, Jesus, we want you to do whatever we ask. Now, I want to kind of aside here for a minute. How many times do we ask that of Jesus? Jesus, give me what I want, Right? Matthew records that it was their mother, uh, I believe her name was Salome, she went up and she said, I want you to give my boys whatever they want, right? That's what a mom does. She looks out after her kids, right? But even, even after telling the disciples three times about his, his coming death and his, his ensuing resurrection, right, the disciples still didn't get it, right? We see that, okay? Now, and you know, I, I think in a lot of, when we see this, I, I think it should give us hope for our faith because see, we have, we have the luxury of having hindsight. We know the whole story. They didn't know the whole story. In fact, this gospel was still being written at that, at this time. Right. But, but this should give us hope, right? These guys, it took them a while to get them. It took them at least three years to get it. Then on the day of Pentecost, everything finally clicked. Right. But <clears throat> The disciples here, they still think Jesus' mission and his purpose is going to affect the here and now, literally, right? Jesus would say, the kingdom of heaven is coming. The kingdom of heaven is already here. And, and so they, we, we see this well on in after Jesus' resurrection, all the way up to about 10 days before the Pentecost, before the day of Pentecost, right? Acts chapter 1, Jesus is ascending into the heaven, into heaven and the disciples ask, Are you, is it now you're restoring the kingdom of heaven? Right? They're, they're still looking for, for Jesus to come down and set up his earthly kingdom. And there's a lot to be said about that. There, there's, that's another sermon for another time, though. There, we should live with anticipation of Jesus coming back at any moment. Right? But 
But the, the gospel here is telling us that, that they didn't really grasp it. So it's okay to struggle with, you know, what's happening now with what's going to happen in the future, right? There, there's, it, it should settle our souls that when we have a crisis of faith and when we find ourselves not really being able to grasp certain biblical teachings, Jesus dealt with 12 guys that really didn't get it either. Right, So it lets us know that being human is okay, but God can, can work with that. Right, Jesus followed this statement up here. Watch what he does in verse 38. Watch what he does in verse 38. Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptize, baptism I am baptized with? Their response there is still just as arrogant. We are. I can do that. Right? I give them props for being very confident. Probably not really arrogant, but they they were they wanted the original question there was we want to have the position of authority when you restore your kingdom. They said, let us sit on your right and your left, right? So it's a selfishly motivated question, right? But the idea here that, that Jesus is conveying here is one, it's a very deep response. The cup that he spoke of in the Old Testament was the, the cup of God's wrath is, is what it's talking about here. Isaiah 51 verse 17 uh, it says, wake yourself, wake yourself up, stand up, Jerusalem, you who have drunk the cup of the, uh, the cup of his fury from the Lord's hand, you who have drunk the goblet of the, to the dregs, the cup that causes people to stagger, right? The cup here is the cup of God's wrath. And we see that throughout, uh, the, the book of revelation, especially when we get into, uh, the bowl judgments, right? It, it's, it's God's wrath being poured out. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's like, can you stand up to God's wrath? Right. Well, what about this baptism thing? Same thing, Old Testament concept, but it, it, it's a it's an idea here of facing an overwhelming experience. And I want to pause for a minute. Maybe you're facing an overwhelming experience, right? We call it you know baptism by fire, right? Being just completely submerged in trials and tribulation, right? Psalm sixty nine two. This is where the idea uh, comes in. I have sunk in deep mud and there is no footing. I have come into deep water and a flood sweeps over me. Right? I'm, I'm way over my head in this. I'm feeling overwhelmed. Right? That's the baptism. And I can imagine that Jesus mentally was overwhelmed by this situation. He knew what was coming. He knew the pain that he was about to endure. He knew the, uh, the, the humility that he was about to endure. Right? Jesus affirmed that he was going to suffer. And the historic, and, but, but Jesus also tells them, he says, yeah, y'all are gonna y'all are gonna face this, right? That's what he tells them. He's like, you're gonna you're gonna drink the cup that that I drink. You're gonna experience the baptism that I experience. You're gonna be tried. You're gonna suffer, right? And the historical record shows James was executed for his faith. I think he lost his head or crucified. It was one of the two. I don't remember. But John John suffered. He was arrested later in life and he was sent to the island of Patmos to spend the rest of his life in isolation. Imagine that when you're in your late 80s, early 90s, right? Being, being sent off to an island by yourself. Imagine that for just one minute. You'd be suffering, I think. Right? With no connection to the outside world. And they didn't have cell phones. They didn't have the internet, right? They had to wait for ships to bring supplies. John had nothing but time to spend worshiping God in exile. But Jesus said this, Jesus said this, that to sit at my side in a position of authority is not mine to give, right? So, so here we see a picture of the God man, right? Jesus is divine. He has the power to redeem people. But there are, certain, there are certain aspects of his character that God reserves, that God reserves. And to give people authority in the kingdom of heaven re re lies only in God. 
Another example, Jesus said, you want to know when the end times are going to happen? I don't even know. Right? So he purposely, he purposely divides that. He purposely separates that. Right? In, in, his, in his divine, and I know that's, that's something to struggle with, but, but it's, a, it's a beautiful picture here that, that Jesus is purposely setting aside, sacrificing certain things so that he can be the redeemer. Right, and it's a beautiful picture of God's sovereignty within the, the the Trinity. But we need to pay close close attention here, right? Why chapter ten very closely parallels chapter nine. Jesus taught of the resurrection. They're they're walking along the road, right? The disciples have an argument in chapter nine. Jesus says, "Hey, what are y'all arguing about?" Nobody says anything. Jesus is like, "Yeah." You're arguing, you're arguing about who's the greatest, right? Well, let me tell you something about that. I'm going to flip the script on you. It's not like you think it is. If you want to be the greatest, you're going to have to be the least, right? Same exact thing that Jesus did in chapter 9, he's doing here in chapter 10, right? So we, we see this, and as the story develops, right, the other 10, the other 10, they're indignant, right? They're pretty upset. Oh, I can't believe the brass ones on those guys coming up to Jesus and saying, ooh, let us have positions of authority. I've, I've done more work than he's done, right? I should be at Jesus' right hand. I, I witnessed to 500 people last week, right? And, and this, is, this is the mentality, right? I healed 25 people yesterday. You only healed two. Right, so I'm, I'm doing better than you are on my scorecard. Right, so everybody here, all 12 of them, they're motivated by selfish ambition. Jesus calls out selfish motivation. Right, he says, are you able to endure what I am about to endure? Jesus wants to know from his disciples, are you willing to suffer just like I'm about to suffer? So Jesus asked the same thing of you today. Are you willing to suffer? Are you willing to set aside your personal desires, your personal goals, your wants, your needs, whatever it is? Are you willing to set aside those ambitions to follow the example that Jesus has laid out for you? All in the name of service to God. That, that's the question that's being asked here. And so we... We put this into practice, right, with, with this. Submit yourself wholly to God's sovereign plan. Submit all of you, every ounce of you, and this falls in line with what Jesus said, that the greatest commandment, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, everything you have, your entire being. This is presenting yourself as a sacrifice, right? We have to be willing to lay our lives down, all of our wants, all of our desires, all of our ambitions in the name of service to God, right? So I want to ask you, what is the root of your motivation for service? What is the root of your motivation for service, right? Do you seek the glory here and now? Jesus said you've already received your reward. If you're looking for a pat on the back, if you're doing it because, well, somebody's going to thank me for it, right? Now, don't hear what I'm not saying is that we should all be doing thankless things. No, that's not it, right? Appreciation is nice. Appreciation is very motivating, right? But, but if that becomes our driving force, we've missed the point. Right? We do things for the glory of God. Our motivation is a heart of service to God. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Paul is encouraging the church of Philippi here, consider other people before you think about yourself. That's what he's saying. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. Do nothing out of conceit. Don't do it for what can I get out of it. Why do we serve God? Do we do it because we're going to get something out of it? Or maybe I, I show up on Sunday because I want to get fed. I want to get fed, right? Have you ever thought about pushing yourself away from the spiritual dinner table and giving somebody else something to eat? That's what Jesus is calling us to do. 
Put aside your selfish ambition. Stop gorging yourself on the word of God and get out there and feed somebody. That's the idea behind discipleship, right? Submit yourself wholly to God's sovereign plan. Watch this one, James chapter 4, verses 13 through 15. I use this one a lot at funerals. Why? Because life is short. James chapter 4, verse 13. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will travel to such and such a city and spend a year. There and do business and make profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will be. For you are like a vapor that appears for a little while, then vanishes. Instead, you should say, mark this down, underline it, highlight it. Instead, you should say, verse 15, if the Lord lives, we will live and do this or that. Life is short. We don't know what tomorrow holds, right? And the approach we have to take every single day, come in close, the approach we have to take every single day is the one we may not be here tomorrow. We're only here now by the grace of God. I live, I got up this morning because God allowed it to happen. Right, So when we say tongue-in-cheekly, well, every day's a blessing. I woke up on this side of the dirt. What are you doing with that? That's what James is saying here. You need to make plans. Make plans. Those aren't a bad thing, right? Have a plan in mind. Where do you want to go? What are your goals, right? But honestly, at the end of the day, you're only here. We are only surviving by God's good grace and God's sovereign will. And we cannot change that. Our plans have to be flexible. I think a lot of us struggle with this. I know I do because of my D-type personality. Our plans have to be fluid because God can change our plans at any time. We must never dig our heels and say, nope, I'm not going there because this is the plan. God can change our plans. And we have to remember that, that when God puts his foot down, I'm not going to move it. But when God redirects my path, I can't say, well, but God, you called me over here. And God says, no, I need you over here now. Right? We can't fight with that because when we start fighting with God's sovereign plan, we're going to fail every single time. Right? So we we have to say, if God wills it, I'm going to do this or that. Because if God doesn't will it, it ain't going to happen. Right? It's submitting yourself to God's will. And that's what Jesus said. He didn't tack it on to the end of a prayer. God, let this cup pass from me, but at the end of the day, it's what you decide. Right? That, that's, that, that's that prayer of resignation. Like, it doesn't matter how I pray. It doesn't matter what I pray for. Right? And Jesus said, Jesus said in his model prayer, you need to pray that God's will will be done here on earth just as it is in heaven. Right? And, and so what we're doing there is submitting ourselves to God's plan. God, if you will it, I want to do this for you. But if you change my plans, I will follow you wholeheartedly. I want to serve you, serve God without restraint. And I want to learn through serving God without self-restraint what true greatness is. And we get to the heart of the passage here. We get to the heart of the passage. True greatness is rooted in service to others. True greatness is rooted in service to others, right? Jesus explained to the disciples here, as he did before, what true greatness is. In the follower of Jesus, verse 42. Jesus called them over and said to them, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those in high position act as tyrants over them. Verse 43, but it is not so among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you will be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you will be a slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. True greatness is rooted in in service to others. This this passage shows us the upside down view of the gospel, right? The gospel comes in, we're we're self-centered, 
We're doing things because we're self-driven, right? The gospel comes in and it flips our lives upside down, literally, because now my life should take the, the last, last position, right? But, but Jesus is using this. He contrasts this with what should be the mentality of the disciples. Jesus said their way of operating here should be opposite of what the world sees, right? Those that are in power, they hold it over your head, right? Caesar had a way of forcing people into Caesar worship. Those that were in, thor- in, a, in positions of authority imposed their will on people. They said, you're going to do what I say or you're going to be executed. Well, I don't want to go to the cross, so I'm going to do what you say, right? It's almost, it's, it's a form of emotional extortion, right? But I want, you to, I want you to look at something here. The word for servant here in this text. The word for servant in the Greek is diakonos. We get our word deacon from it, Right? So, so Jesus says, the son of man didn't come to be deaconed to, he came to be a deacon. Right? And he says, if you, if you want to be great, you're going to have to be a deacon to all people. That, that's what he's saying here. He says, you're going to have to be a servant to all people. He goes deeper there. He, he says, whoever wants to be first must be a slave to all. The word there for slave is doulos. It is bond servant. That means I have enslaved myself to somebody. I have willingly enslaved myself to somebody for their service, for their good purpose, for their will. Right? And, and throughout the New Testament, throughout the letters in the New Testament, uh, Paul says, Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ. John, in the book of Revelation, he says, I am a slave of Jesus Christ. We're all called to be slaves of Jesus Christ, but Jesus is calling us to be a slave of how many people? All. Right? There's, there's, there's a thing about that, that word, All. It's pretty quirky when you translate it. It means all. All people. Right? So if you want to be great, if you want to be, uh, if you want to be known for what you're doing, you've got to humble yourself and serve everybody. That's what Jesus is getting at, and he uses his example. He says, whoever wants to be first, slave to all. Right? And then he goes in deeper, and he says, for even, watch this transition here, for even the Son of Man... Right, the creator, he didn't come to be served, but we, you know, we call him Lord. Nothing exists without his permission, right? But he didn't come to be served. He came to serve. He didn't come to be, uh, to be deaconed to. He came to be a deacon. He came to serve the needs of the people. We see this very, very clearly in John chapter 13, right? Here we go again, same song and dance. The disciples are sitting at the Last Supper with Jesus, and they have this little discussion. So when Jesus comes back and he sits in his glory, he's going to pick me to sit at his right hand. No, he's not. He's going to pick me, right? This is the discussion that went on, right? So Jesus gets up without even being noticed. He goes over, takes off his cloak, takes off his, his tunic, right? grabs a towel, wraps it around him. While these guys are still arguing about who's the greatest, right? He gets a wash basin and he comes over and he sits down, right? And he starts washing feet, right? Why, why is that important? Well, because you got to remember the streets of Jerusalem, they had animals running through there. People probably threw their bedchamber pots out on the streets. It's pretty nasty streets and they're walking amongst it. Right? So, so according to house custom, the only person that could do that was a Gentile slave. Because even the Jewish slaves were too good for that. Right? So here you've got Jesus. He's washing feet. He's sitting down, right? And, and Peter says, oh, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus says, what I'm doing for you, you have no idea the implications of this. Right? And he, he uses it as a teaching lesson. He says, what I have just done for you the way I have served you, the way I have deaconed to you, 
you must do to other people. Right? Now, I, I, I'm telling you, I don't like feet. They're gross. Right? I don't know if I could do that. That's the human side of me. But I know what Jesus calls me to do. Jesus calls me to say, yeah, I can do that. Right? So, so this is a very humbling picture, right? The second part of, of Jesus' statement here is that his mission was to offer his life as a ransom for many. The idea here is being set free or being released from captivity, right? And this is done uh, by Jesus bearing the full wrath of God on our behalf. And I'll give you a reference. I don't have time to read the whole chapter. Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53, if you read that, it's a beautiful passage on the suffering servant, the humiliation that Jesus went through, right? Service to God and others is rooted in humility. It's rooted in humility instead of selfish ambition. And that means for us, those of us who claim to follow Jesus as seeing no job as too menial, or no job as being unimportant. Guess what? If you show up here, if I'm running on time, about 8.30, 9 o'clock, Sunday morning, most times you're going to find me in here cleaning this church the best I can. I don't do a very good job at it, but guess what? I do it. If a toilet stopped up, I do it. Oh, pastor, you're just bragging. No. Here's the deal. The reason why people tell you what they're doing is not to get accolades, but you're not here. So guess what? You don't see me doing it. So I have to tell you, right? This is what goes on when you're not paying attention. Or this is what goes on when you walk in the bathroom and you're like, they need to clean this place, right? Drives me off the wall. Hey, pastor's doing the best he can. Just saying. He's got to be janitor, carpenter, and I got to serve the word on Sunday mornings. Right? I'm just saying. What are you called to do? Complain? Or are you called to get up and do something? There is no task that is too below you to do. This is what I'm getting at here. There is no task that is too below us to do. If Jesus can wash feet, guess what? I can scrub toilets. That's how that works, right? Right? Service to God is rooted in humility instead of selfish ambition. Right? John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verses 12 through 15. Almost done. Jesus says, this is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. No one has a greater love than this, to lay down his life for his friends. Right? And Jesus says, you're my friends if you do what I command you. We're no longer alienated from Jesus if we do what he commands us. What is that? What is that? What is the command? This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. And when you do that, when you lay your life down in humble service to anybody, to everybody, right? You are my friends. He says, I don't call you servants anymore. Because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. Jesus says, I have called you friends because I have made it known to you everything I've heard from my father. Jesus hasn't hidden anything from us. Right? Our service has to be rooted in love for others instead of self. We love other people more than we love ourselves. We care for other people more than we care about ourselves. Now, I'm not saying neglect personal hygiene, get rid of everything, stop taking showers, all that kind of good stuff. No. But, you know, healthy balance here, healthy boundaries, right? But don't, don't consider yourself as better than other people. And that brings us to the last part. How do we put this into practice? Crucify selfish ambitions to glorify God. Crucify selfish ambitions to glorify God. <clears throat> Excuse me. The idea here of taking up a cross is the idea of crucifixion. The cross was an instrument of torture. It was a death device. And it's the same idea here that Paul presents to the church in Galatians. Chapter 5, verse 24. He says, now those who belong to Christ Jesus, they have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, right? I want to do something for me. Put it to death. I want to do this so I can get thanks. Put it to death. 
That, that's, what, that's what Paul's getting at there, right? When we crucify the flesh, we crucify selfish desires, we crucify our ambitions, it is an act on our part. We have to do something there. We've got to put it to death, right? We take our sinful flesh, we nail that on a cross. Oh, I love that. I love that part. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, right? Right? We have to take our sin and we've got to nail that sucker to the cross and leave it there and let it die. That's what he's getting at here. Ephesians chapter 4, right? We put all selfish desires for the sake of others. We do that, unity ensues. It's Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, right? When we show humility, when we show patience, when we bear each other's burdens, right? Guess what? We're unified, right? If you're worried about yourself, you're not going to be unified. If I'm worried about myself, I'm not going to be in a group that's worried about others. Why? Because it makes me feel uncomfortable, right? When we humble ourselves, when we see others as greater than us, and I don't mean in a self-deprecating sort of way, like, oh, I'm worthless. I'm, you know, not like that. But, but you see that your needs and your desires and your preferences are not better than anybody else's, right? Then, then that's when we find ourselves in a position of humility. So I want to I ask you this. What motivates you to serve? What motivates you to serve? Is there, is there something you will not do under any circumstances? Okay, I get that. There's some things we don't like to do. There's some things that, that turn our stomach. You know, I, I get that. I understand that. But there's other things we could be doing. What are, you, what are you doing in service to the church? Well, I don't know what to do. If you see a need, fill it. Right? That's what Jesus did when he served the disciples. Right? He didn't say, hey, can I wash y'all's feet? No. He got up and he started doing it. Right? If you see a need, fill it. They needed a lesson in humble service, right? So, that, so that's what Jesus did, right? If Jesus, is, if Jesus can wash feet, I can clean the bathroom. If Jesus can wash feet, I can mow yards. If Jesus can wash feet, I can deliver groceries to a shut-in. If Jesus can wash feet, I can ask my neighbor what they need. Right? This, is, this is what Jesus is calling us to do. We've got to get out of our comfort zones, right? Things aren't the way they used to be. Ministry has changed, and I think it's changed for the better. The, the, the question is, how are we leveraging this for kingdom work, right? We're scared. I get that. We don't want to come in contact with strangers. I get that, right? We're, we're afraid of, of catching something that might kill us because we have a, a, an underlying condition, right? I get that. I do. But we can do things safely. And guess what? We have a home, whether, whether it's a, a house or an apartment or a, a, one of the townhouses, a quadplex, a duplex, whatever. You've got neighbors. How are you talking across the fence to them? How are you reaching out? Because this is the church. Being the church is serving other people regardless of the way you view them, right? They need to be served. There's a lost and dying world out here that needs to be served, right? I told you last week, the numbers of people that have died from COVID, whatever you believe, I don't care. The numbers are there, Three, almost four, over 400,000 this week, right? That's more than the population of the city of Corpus. Now, imagine... 60% of those people dying and going to hell because that's what's happening on a daily basis, right? And we're sitting at home doing nothing about it, right? Where has God called you to serve? You've got neighbors. Talk to them. They, they get out and about, whether they're out mowing their yard or what. Guess what? You can stand on the sidewalk and talk six feet away from them. I do with my neighbor all the time. Right? Don't talk politics. Right? Don't talk world events because that just gets us stirred up, right? How can I serve you, neighbor? Is there something I can pray for you about? 
Here, let me pray for you right here. Because I'm going to tell you, everybody's got struggles going on right now. What, motiv what motivates you to serve? Do you want to see the kingdom grow? Or do you just want to sit and be served? Right? The church is not about gathering once a week in a building. And I, 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 don't, believe that, I don't believe for one bit that that's the New Testament model of the church. The New Testament model of the church was they went from house to house. They were in neighborhoods. They were going house to house. Right? Start a study group in your home. Right? You don't want to bring people into your home? Start it out on your front yard, right? Get out on your front yard. People are going to get curious. What are they doing out there, right? Hey, study the Bible with me, right? If you got a question, hey, guess what? We can call my pastor. We'll put him on speakerphone. We'll ask him the question. I don't care. Call somebody you know if you run into a question, right? But if you want to read, if you want resources, I'll help you. I know all kinds of resources. I'll help you get started with one. I want to start a home study group, right? We don't have to meet in church to study the Bible. This is what I'm saying. And guess what? When you have a study group at home, you have a 90% better chance at reaching somebody. So how are you serving? How are you impacting your neighborhood for the gospel today? Are you too proud? It requires humility. And as, as we close out this morning, I want, I want you to think about that. Where, what are my reasons for not reaching out to people? And I get it. Fear of rejection is a big one. But guess what? That's a self-oriented response. I don't want people to reject me. Jesus just told his disciples that he was going to be rejected and mocked and spit on and things like that. And if we're not rejected and mocked and spit on and abused and crucified, guess what? We're not following Jesus wholeheartedly. And that's, that's what Jesus is getting at here. He's like, you're going to have to endure some suffering. He says, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have conquered the world. I have overcome everything that this world has to offer, and you can too. All you have to do is focus on me, deny yourself, serve others wholeheartedly, there's nothing too below you. As we go out, take this message. Where's God calling you to serve? <clears throat> See what opportunities are there in your neighborhood. Because that's my prayer for this church, that we will get out and we will make a difference in this community because that's the only way this nation and this city and this world is going to change is if we get out, we get off of the pews, we stop gorging on the word of God and we get out and we put it into practice. I, I firmly believe that. I, I firmly believe that we need to pray wholeheartedly for God's will to prevail here on earth and not what I want, not what you want, but what God wants. And I pray that we as a church can follow where God is leading. Pray with me that, that we will humble ourselves and enter the throne of grace, begging and throwing ourselves on God's mercy and saying, God, I want to serve you wholeheartedly without restraint, and I want to submit myself to your sovereign plan. If you will it, I will wake up tomorrow, and I will serve you. Let that, let that be our, our focus this week as we go to the Lord in prayer. God, merciful, holy Father, God, we know that you are gracious. We know that you are kind. We know that you are loving. But God, we also understand that you are holy and that you are righteous. God, I pray on our behalf this morning that you will pour out your, your spirit upon this community. That you will open our eyes to see where the opportunities are to minister to others. And that, that we will set aside our selfish desires, our personal comforts. That we will sacrifice ourselves on the altar of service to you. God, I pray that you will use us as individuals, as a body, that we can make a difference in this community. God, there's somebody here that, that's struggling with a calling. Lord, I pray that you will make that calling clear to them of where you're having them go. And I pray that they will follow you willingly. God, help us to be good stewards of the gospel. Help us to share this message with other people. Help us to give hope in this dark world. 
and help us to serve joyfully above all that we can glorify your name through everything we do. God, we love you, we praise you, and we honor you. And we pray all these things in the only name we know how, the powerful, the mighty, the majestic name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people agreed and said, amen. amen. Have a wonderful day. Oh, he was getting the notification. All right. Well, let's uh, go ahead and get started. We'll open up with a word of prayer and then we'll uh, pick up where we left off last week. So let's uh, have a word of prayer. God, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy as we uh, delve into this study and as we continue, God, I pray that you teach us, open our hearts and our minds, uh, help us to see the truth uh, and the application of your word. And uh, as we uh, go through this, there will be many points we disagree on. Uh, help us to uh, encourage one another and uh, be able to debate the issues um, clear-headedly. And God, we just uh, pray that you will uh, teach us most of all, above all else, that we can share this message with everybody. God, we thank you and we love you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so uh, we're going to uh, pick up where we left off last week. Um, it was kind of, I know last week I went through, there was a lot of information covered, uh, a lot to process, uh, maybe some uh, old ideas, some new ideas, uh, some stuff you may have haven't heard in a while. But uh, uh, approaching the book of Revelation, um, you know, we, we always want to take a balanced approach, uh, to how we interpret it. As I said last week, this is apocalyptic literature. There are a lot of signs and symbols in there. Uh, numbers, uh, represent, uh, certain ideas, <coughs> uh, things of that way, uh, of that, uh, uh, aspect. But my goal with this is to take a balanced approach uh, in the interpretation, because if we look at this as strictly future events, I think we lose a lot in the way of what does it mean to us today and, and how can we apply that? So uh, the approach I will be taking, uh, of course, I am a futurist, uh, pre-millennial uh, point of view. Uh, and depending on what day of the week it is, I may be a pre-tribulation or a mid-tribulation uh, rapture kind of guy. Uh, just depends on just depends on who I read that day and and you know the way the way I'm feeling. Uh, but uh, uh, that's kind of as far as the timeline of the Book of Revelation goes. That's the way I will approach it: is a futurist pre-millennial uh, point of view, meaning that. The events uh, are supposed to take place in the future, and they will take place before uh, the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Um, the rapture, honestly, we could debate that till we're blue in the face, and it's been debated for 2,000 years, and nobody still has a solid answer on it. So <laughs> that that one, I don't, I don't really think it affects uh, anything. Uh, a word of advice on the rapture, don't let it become an escape mechanism. And what I mean by that is, and I've heard people say this um, in taking the millennial view that I never talked about, the pan-millennial view. Well, it doesn't matter because I'm not going to be here and it'll all pan out in the end. And so uh, we, we don't want to use the rapture as an escape mechanism that I, I get that some of the ideas are scary and terrifying. But the overall picture of this is God is a holy and righteous God, and he is just, and he judges sin accordingly, and that is what is terrifying. And I think that's because that, that's what this all focuses on is God's judgment of creation. 
uh, in in that aspect. And so, you know, don't don't let the rapture, uh, you know, uh, give you a, give you cause to say, well, I'm not going to look at the book of Revelation because it doesn't really apply to me and everybody else needs to figure it out on their own. But the uh, the second way I want to take it is a balanced view of the four main uh, views, the the futurist, the preterist, the historical uh, and, and all of that, the idealist, because there are some ideas in here that if we look at it as being future, we won't we won't understand, like taking the mark of the beast, um, you know, or, you know, the the acceleration in persecution of the church uh, in things, you know, a one world government, you know, 10 kingdoms, you know, things, uh, things like that. And, and it can get really confusing. And so, you know, the, the goal with this is, you know, what, what is God's view on, on sin? How does he deal with it? And, you know, how does that apply in, in our lives uh, today? So that's, that's kind of the goal I want to take with that. Um, so the, there's uh, when you actually get down to brass tacks, there's two uh, there's two things that are non-negotiable in the interpretation of the Book of Revelation and any other book of the Bible. And the first one is the original, specific historical context, meaning that every book of the Bible was written to a specific group of people at a specific time under a specific set of circumstances. Okay. We, we have to understand those. And sometimes it's a little bit difficult, especially when we start dealing with old Testament stuff. It's hard to, it's hard to get some of their, their specific context, especially when you don't know who wrote the book, but we kind of deduce. That's why I depend on guys that are smarter than me uh, to, uh, to tell me that information. But the, uh, the original historical context, we have to understand that. But the second context is, the overall biblical or what they call the canonical context. So what that gives us is the historical grammatical uh, context of, of a book of the Bible. How does it fit into God's plan? And, and the book of Revelation is just that. It is the, it is the bow, if you will, on the uh, crimson thread that runs through all of Scripture. Genesis starts out with perfection and ends with death and dying and sin and corruption and revolution. Re revelation begins with death and dying and sin and corruption and ends with perfection. So, so we see how the, the Bible can be bookended uh, with, with both of these books. And, and that's the, that's the beauty of all that. Um, but the book of Revelation was not meant to not written by the Holy Spirit to confuse people because God is not the author of confusion. He doesn't do things on purpose to make us wonder and debate. We do that on our own. But the book of Revelation, as I said last week, it is the revealing of Jesus Christ. It is the unveiling of Jesus Christ in all of his glory. And uh, uh, when we look at that, uh, we see God's uh, sovereignty uh, play out and how nothing thwarts uh, God's plan to, uh, to consummate history. So when we, when we do that, if we take, here's the notes. For this. Uh, when, we, when we look at that in, in those contexts, then we start to get a clear picture of what and why uh, things were written. And so the first question uh, we look at and we need to answer is why was Revelation written? Okay. And my first answer to that is to bless those who read, listen to, and apply the teaching. To bless those who read, listen to, and apply the teaching. Uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Uh, it says... Blessed is the one who reads aloud the word of this prophecy, the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear the words of this pro prophecy and keep what is written in it because the time is near. So Revelation is the only book in the Bible, and I've tried to research this as best I can. Revelation is the only book in the Bible that actually pronounces a blessing 
on those who read it. Um, we have to understand that this was a congregational letter. The whole, the whole thing was a congregational letter. So when John put pen to paper, wrote out what he saw in his vision, and then sent it out to Ephesus, Ephesus made a copy of it, and then sent it on about its way. Uh, it was a circulatory letter. What they would do is when they got the letter, they would read it from start to finish in one sitting. Um, you know, however, however long that took, whether it be a team of people reading it or, you know, uh, if some person sat down and said, hey, you know, I'm the only one in this group that can read it. So let me read it out and we'll tell you what uh, what John says. So they you know, and this is the way all of the churches did. If you can imagine sitting down and reading the, the letter to the Romans in one sitting, I think it's also uh, 20 chapters. Um, the book of Revelation is quite lengthy. Uh, in fact, I think it took me three hours one night to read from start to finish, and that was without without pausing. Um, so we think, you know, an hour, hour and a half for church is long. These guys would sit around, you know, in, you know, on a Sunday morning or a Saturday evening or whatever, and they would start reading it, and then they would sit around and discuss it. Uh, you know, and uh, the book of Acts said Paul was preaching one time till midnight. Uh, people started falling asleep on him and falling off balconies. But it, it was designed, the, the whole point uh, of, of the book of Revelation is to bless those who read, who listen to, and apply the teaching. Because we see in this, uh, in this here, uh, blessed is the one who reads aloud. So just by sitting down and reading the book of Revelation, there's a, there's a blessing that comes with that. Um, what is the major blessing? Well, we read through it and we get to the, the last two chapters of Revelation. We see... God's glory come down from heaven and inhabit the earth. And, and the entire creation, the curse, the curse that, that was enacted in Genesis chapter three has been removed. Uh, evil has been judged. Sin has been cast out of God's presence and the entire earth has been recreated. And, and this is the beauty. And then that leads on into uh, eternity. And so there's a blessing in that, knowing that God is sovereign and his will triumphs uh, in the end. So and then, you know, of course, there's, you know, there's the blessing on, on the listener as well. You know, you, you listen to it, you hear it. And then there's the other the other blessing of doing what it says. Uh, some translation says, blessed, blessed is the one who, who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Uh, blessed are those who hear and keep the words, uh, you know, keep what is written. And that's basically applying the teaching to your life. There, there's a blessing that, uh, that comes along with that. So uh, we have a threefold blessing there. Uh, the next thing is, is to give unshakable hope to suffering Christians. And uh, I, I think this one, I think we tend to miss this one sometimes. Um, to give us, you know, to give us unshakable hope when, when we look at the scope of, of John's sovereignty. Um, Revelation chapter 1, uh, verses 4 through 6, uh, it says, uh, John, to the seven churches in Asia, grace and peace to you from the one who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the, the, the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth to him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom priest to God, priest to his God and father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we see here in all of this, the, the theme of the eternal uh, triune God. And uh, we, we get this when we see that God is completely sovereign. And, and I know people struggle with this um, in, in the aspect of God's sovereignty. So when I, when I say that God is sovereign, what I mean is that when God makes a decision, nobody can change that decision. If, if, if that makes sense. Okay. When, when God, when God puts his hand down and we'll see this in revelation chapter three, 
of the, the, the letters to, he says, I am the one who opens and no one can shut. I'm the one who shuts and no one can open. So when God moves, nobody can move what God has done. There, there's no, you know, come hell or high water, God's will is going to triumph. And, and that's, you know, that that's the case of God's sovereignty. We can't take this to the extreme and say, well, God is sovereign and he's going to do what he wants to anyway. I, I don't think that that really pictures God's sovereignty, God's sovereignty is sovereignty. I can't talk tonight in a positive aspect <laughs> because then we make out, we make God out to be one of those. He, he moves us around like chess pieces. And, and I don't, I don't necessarily think that, that God operates uh, in that way. But, but we see here that, that God is completely sovereign over all creation, all of history. God's plan will prevail. Nothing is going to thwart that. And the devil can think what he wants to, but he is not equal to God, not even in the same playing field as God. He is subordinate to God, and he only operates within what God allows him to do. And we're going to see this occur. They were given permission. They were given authority to harm the people, but they were they were told they could only do so much. They were told they couldn't kill these people or whatever the case may be. But but through that, we have hope. We, we find this hope in the ultimate consummation of God's plan for, for all of his people, for all of creation and, and all of his eternity or, and all of eternity. Uh, we have to keep in mind that this book was written to actual Christians that were suffering persecution under Domitian uh, in the, in the 90s, uh, it was a pretty intense persecution. They had just come out of suffering under Nero and a lot of them had scattered but Nero was notorious for uh, crucifying Christians and then uh, dousing them with oil and using them as lamps to light the streets at night. Um, they, you know, and Nero was, uh, and, and I think Domitian even to a, a large extent, they were notorious for capturing Christians and literally throwing them to the lions in the Colosseum just for entertainment, you know, just because they didn't have anything better to do. You know, and, and this was because... They, the, the Christians held fast to their beliefs and, and stood on the foundation of the gospel. And, and they didn't deny their faith. All of the apostles, uh, except for John, uh, they all faced uh, persecution. They all faced execution for their faith. John was the only one that died a natural death. And he died, like I said this morning, in exile on the island of Patmos in solitude at the age of almost 100. I couldn't imagine living my days out like that. You know, in, in lonely solitude, like no nobody could get to you. You can't get to nobody. No email, no text messages, no telephone calls, no TV, no nothing. Just completely out of touch with the world. And all you get was maybe once a week or once a month, a ship that came in and brought some, uh, you know, one little bit of supplies they may have had left and, and drop them off for you. So when, uh, you know, we, we look at this and, uh, you know, that, that's where we get uh, verse nine there. John tells us he was in the island of Patmos. So the, the question comes up, how are we blessed? Um, and how do we find unshakable hope? And looking at the first chapter of this um, is, is key to evaluating the entire book of Revelation. Um, so we, when we look at that, you know, in order to understand what follows, um, we begin to see God's sovereignty play out in all of this from, from the first verse. Uh, we find hope in, in God's plan. And, and so what I want you to see here is through chapter one, uh, the first thing is see God's greatness. See, see God's greatness because when we see God's eternal nature, and we see this repeated uh, here from the one who is and who was and who is to come, you know, I am the first and the last. I am the Alpha and Omega. Uh, we, we see this. We see God's eternalness. We see God's sovereignty uh, play out through, through all of this. And we find uh, we should be able to find hope in that, that, that God is none of this surprises God. None of what happens on this earth ever surprises God. The, the, the election we just had, this, this pandemic that we're in the middle of, you know, the stock market crash, none of that surprises God. God knows what's going to happen 10 years from now. 
And, and God can not necessarily manipulate people, but move people into place to, to fulfill his plan, even if that means using unsaved people to accomplish his task. And we see that through the, uh, through the arrest, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, where you know, you've got Judas. Judas betrayed Jesus. You know, more than likely, there's probably a 99% chance he was not saved. Um, you've got Pontius Pilate. He was a Greek. He had no interest in the gospel. You've got, you know, all of the all of the powers that be, the Roman centurions, you know, all of that God used to let his plan play out. And we will see throughout the course of, of Revelation that all of this is part of God's plan. There's going to be an Antichrist rise up. He's going to persecute Christians. And, you know, so why, why does all this happen? But in the end, all of it works out for God's glory and God's good, uh, good greatness. So we see God's greatness. But uh, the second thing here is we can't miss this. See the gospel. To, to see the gospel jump out at you. And, and I think when we, when we really look at this, we, we see God's character play out in all of this. His holiness, his righteousness, his his judging. I don't want to say judginess, but uh, his his judgment. Uh, but we also see his love, his compassion uh, for his people. We're we're going to see his his justice play out because everybody that's wronged every Christian for throughout all of history, they they're going to have to pay the piper, if you will. <coughs> So, you know, and then we see that, you know, then we see, you know, the offense of our sin, you know, the offense of mankind's sin, that, that mankind is dysfunctional. Mankind is set opposed to God. Mankind is, is set at that, that position of being children of wrath. But then, you know, then you've got, you know, Jesus's, uh, you know, the sufficiency of Christ and all of this, that Jesus paid the price and that all we have to do is place our faith in Jesus Christ and we will be protected to a large extent from a lot of this. And I believe, you know, whether you believe the rapture happens before the tribulation, in the middle, after, doesn't happen, whatever the case may be, the, the truth of the matter is, is that God does, and, and there's, there's passages in here that we see, God protects his people throughout all of these judgments, that these judgments don't befall a lot on, you know, now there may be some collateral damage, but the judgments are not aimed at God's people. And, and you know, there, there's, you know, there's stuff, you know, like we talk about the ceiling of the 144,000 and there's a judgment that comes across and they says that, that these, uh, I think it's the locusts, these locusts are told not to harm those that are sealed by God. And, and, and so we see that, that there's, there's, there's God's mercy and, 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 and his protection and, and all of that. But it requires, you know, that we make a decision to follow Jesus Christ. And that's, you know, at the end, that's uh, that's what uh, what changes uh, changes our perspective in all this. But we, we see the gospel here play out in verses five and six. That the book of Revelation comes from God given to Jesus, given to an angel uh, to give to John. Uh, and then it says uh, there in verse five, uh, where he's given the, the doxology and the greeting, he says, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. And if you want to underline that ruler of the kings of the earth, because I think that's a pretty powerful statement. Jesus is in complete control over the governments of the earth. That, that's, a, that's a pretty powerful statement there. But uh, we move into the gospel here, uh, the rest of verse five. To him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to God, priest to his God and father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. So so we see the, you know, we see the gospel play out just in the in the 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 first five verses, uh, first five or six verses there. But we also see that uh, Jesus is the conquering savior over, over death. Uh, Jesus is the conquering savior over death. And what, what we mean by that is that death doesn't hold any grip on a, on a Christian. And, and this, is, this is the beauty of the gospel in, in Jesus's resurrection is that 
uh, as First Corinthians, uh, as First, yeah, First Corinthians fifteen, it says, "Oh, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? The sting uh, of sin is death. That that we, you know, we're terrified of dying because we're sinners without a savior. But when we have a savior, there is no more pain. There is no more uh, sadness uh, that comes uh, that comes from death." Uh, we don't have to fear death because we know that when we take our last breath, when we close our eyes here, that we'll close our eyes for a moment and then we're going to wake up and we're going to be in the presence of the Savior. And, and this is this is the beauty of that is that Jesus conquered all of that uh, on our on our behalf. Uh, the next thing we're going to see is that uh, Jesus is still in authority today. And we're going to see this uh, in the last part. Uh, of chapter one, uh, that Jesus is still in authority today. We talk about that he he walks among his lampstands. It's it's an active walking. It's a present tense walking. That Jesus is walking now among his church, and uh, so so we know we see that he's still in authority today. And then uh, the next thing is that Jesus will return to claim his earthly throne forever. So there's probably a little bit of a mind shift that we need to make here. Um, right now, heaven is separated from earth. And it's, it's the, the physical is separated from the spiritual. And what I mean by that is that when we die, we, we go to heaven. What is heaven? Okay, by definition, heaven is the place where God resides. God does not reside here on earth because he can't because the earth is under a curse and God can't uh, God can't reside where sin exists. So sin has to be taken care of completely. OK, the book of Revelation plays out. OK, and it says the curse is removed. There was no more curse. Everything, everything here on this earth is under a curse right now. It's destined to fall apart. It's destined to break. Uh, vegetation dies. Plants and animals, you know. Uh, nature, you know, we see the fires and the earthquakes and the floods and, you know, the, all the cataclysmic hurricanes and, and things like that. So everything, the earth is under a curse. Everything is dysfunctional. Our, our bodies are dysfunctional. A at some point in God's good timing, when he decides that it's time for all this to be consummated, okay, this, this, this heaven where God is residing now is going to be rejoined with, with this creation. And everything is going to be recreated. So heaven will, in essence, come down to earth and, and they will be reunited because the curse will no longer uh, separate them. Does that make sense? I know it's a it's a it's a little bit deep, but but this is this is kind of a, a biblical picture of, of what what heaven really looks like. And I'm, I'm trying to wrap my brain around it as we as we go, because like this blew me away. I was like, OK, you know. We leave the earth like we're no longer going to be here, but eventually we will be back. God's kingdom will be back here on earth with the new Jerusalem comes down <coughs> and, uh, you know, Jesus returns with all of his people to, to do away with with evil for good. Uh, but verse seven there, uh, it says, you know, look, he is coming with the clouds. Uh, that's a, a literal sense. Uh, every eye will see him. That is a physical sense. Even those who pierced him, uh, which which gives us an idea that those who played a part in the crucifixion uh, of Jesus uh, will will actually see Jesus return as the conquering Messiah. And all of the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. Why will they mourn? Because when Jesus returns in all of his glory, Everybody will come face to face. Everybody will come face to face with how sinful we really were. And, and when we understand that, that's going to make us sad. But for those that don't accept Jesus Christ, they're going to mourn because I believe that when Jesus splits that eastern sky and he comes back, like it's too late at that point. I, uh, you can't. There's, there's no, there's no chance in a Gentile accepting the gospel at that point, um, because when Jesus comes, he's coming to defeat the the armies uh, of of Satan, and immediately after that will follow uh, will follow judgment. 
So, you know, there, there's people that are going to recognize, oh my goodness, this was all real and I called it a fairy tale and they're going to mourn, they're going to wail and eternity for them is going to be nothing but pain and misery and uh, all of, you know, all of that that follows along with that. Um, so we've got, uh, we've got that. Uh, let me stop right there and uh, anybody got any questions before we go on? Okay, so when you're talking about the God can't come down to earth until all the sin is gone. Uh huh. So when he was here with Adam and Eve, there uh -huh. wasn't any sin until she Correct. Okay. Yeah. In the in the Garden of Eden, God God could actually come down. He would walk in the garden with, with Adam and Eve when they disobeyed. God came down for that brief moment and they brought the curse down and God, he, he was removed from, he removed himself because he could no longer be here on earth. So when you, when you go up to the Exodus and they build the tabernacle, the tabernacle, they had to go through a process of cleansing the tabernacle before they could put the ark in there and before God's presence could come in there. It had to be cleansed. Physically and and God, that was the only place. That's why the temple is so important for the Jews, because once they have that cleanse, the holy of holies. Once they have that cleanse, God can then come back down and and reside in in that spot. According to the Jews, that is the only place on earth that God can reside, because it is it, God sanctified that as sacred ground. That's that's His spot, and and that's that's where He resides. Makes sense. Okay. So yes, ma'am. Right. They, they were evicted from the Garden of Eden because at that point they lost access to God's perfection. The Garden of Eden was perfect. And when they disobeyed, then God said, OK, this is the punishment. Like a kid, you know, disobeying his parents. OK, you're grounded. You lose your phone. You lose your video games, whatever the case may be. And, and, and it's the same thing. You know, you disobeyed. So now you lose access to what I have made for you. And then he shut the garden and everything started withering because that was that was part of the that was part of the curse. But they saw that place is still over there in the far east, the garden of Eden, but it's a guess. It's where it's located. Um biblically speaking, it is between the Tigris and Euphrates. Um, it sits in modern day Iraq. Um, the Garden of Eden actually reside and you know, interesting little you know, factoid of trivia. The Fertile Crescent, where most archaeologists say that humanity started, dates are, you know, we, uh, you know, I understand biblical creation dates, but that's where most of mankind came from, was in the Fertile Crescent area, that the Garden of Eden lied between the Tigris and Euphrates, which is kind of a, a triangle like so, and, and it comes down uh, where modern day uh, Baghdad uh, runs through uh, the Tigris and the Euphrates run on either side of them. And, and so, you know, there, there was a fertile area there. And of course, now we see that it's all, it's all dried up. Um, but yeah, that, that's where they don't know exactly where, if it was the whole area or if it was just one particular spot, because the, the rivers that bounded on the North and South, I don't know if the, I think those rivers have dried up, so they can't really pinpoint exactly what part of Iraq it is, but that's, that, yeah, according to biblical standards, yeah, it, it, uh, the Garden of Eden was in modern day Iraq, uh, somewhere near the city of Baghdad. So, huh? It, it is, it is kind of, a, it is almost an irony of sorts, uh, but sin started there and sin has never left the place. You know, and you know, that the, the Middle East has always been a hotbed of, of strife and, and all of that kind of good stuff. But eventually, uh, when we understand covenants uh, and how covenants work, we, we see that Jesus will return uh, to claim his earthly throne uh, forever. Yes, ma'am. So I'm sorry. So the little stuff I played real quick. Okay. Uh, I don't know. I don't know exactly. Uh, 
I know there are there are a couple of the uh, the plagues that they're specifically told not to harm those that are sealed by God. Uh, you know, now if I get caught in an earthquake, you know, will I die? Well, I'm a human, so more than likely I probably will. You know, if I get caught in a hundred pound, if I get caught underneath a hundred pound hailstone, I don't think I want to live through that. Yeah. You know, so, so you know, there, there's there there will probably be some uh, collateral damage uh, like uh, like that. Uh, you know, but that, but there are you know, the, the point of that is, is that evil only operates within the parameters that God allows it to operate. We go back to the book, the book of Job on that one, uh, that, that Satan's given a lot of leeway, but he's told you can't take his life from him. You can, you know, you can harm his family. You can give him sores and illnesses and all of that, but you cannot take his life. And we, you know, we see a, we see a lot of that play out. Um, so the, uh, uh, the next thing there that we see from this is that Jesus loves all who follow him in obedience. And so I want to, I want to kind of take this and say, our salvation is not based on how well we are obedient. We are saved by grace into good works. If that makes sense, our good works become a response to the salvation by grace. Uh, we're saved by grace. You know, God has redeemed us from uh, from eternal condemnation, and so we respond to that by by serving God. Um, you know, by living in obedience. But Jesus said, "If you love me, keep my commandments." You know, and I can. You know, I I will love those. You know. Who, uh, you know, kind of bad paraphrasing here, but you know, Jesus loves basically all those who hear my hear His commands and and follow them. Uh, the uh, the next thing there about Jesus is that He freed us uh, from the slavery of sin. Uh, he He set us free, which means that we're no longer under the blood of Jesus Christ. We're no longer slaves to ourselves if you will. We're no longer driven by ego. We're no longer driven by selfish desires. Our, our mindset changes and we're no longer bound to do the things that we see as, I guess, pleasurable or, you know, uh, what makes us feel good or, you know, any anything like that because we become bound to the, the pleasures of this world. And I'll, I'll give you an example. So uh, I know a guy, not me, but he wanted to give his children everything. So he gets a good job and they get involved in, you know, he got four kids. They get involved in event after event, after event, after event. And so it, you know, it costs money to do all this stuff. Well, now he's got to work overtime just to support you know, the big property that he bought so his family could have a place to play, the lake house they're renting, um, you know, all of their water toys, you know, all of the, the kids' uh, extracurricular activities, getting them all the nice things. So he, he has now become a slave to his job. And so in providing for his children, he's now missing out on birthdays. You know, he's now missing out on recitals. You know, not getting to go on the weekends, you know, because his, you know, his days off rotate or he's got to work his days off or anything like that. He's now become a slave to his job because he set the bar so high and doesn't want to disappoint his children. OK, that's that's kind of us getting involved in that, that you know, that that sinful cycle where we, you know, we start becoming slaves to, you know, why well, I got to keep feeding this. So I got to keep doing this. And, and so, you know, through Jesus, we're freed from all of that. We're free to stop being dependent on the pleasures of this world and to serve God uh, and, and be, be happy with that. Uh, any questions? Nothing over there? Okay. Sorry, I thought I saw y'all. Uh, okay. So how do we put this uh, in, in perspective for us? How do we apply this? Well, first of all, see your position in Jesus. Um, see your position in Jesus. We're not just under his rule. 
we are actually part of, because he's made us a kingdom of priests, uh, we are actually part of his reign here on earth. We are a part of the kingdom of God uh, in, in that. Uh, but not only that, you know, we're not only citizens, but we're actually, we're, we're in, a, in essence, you know, rulers uh, in the kingdom. We're, we're pushing, we're, we're ambassadors, we're emissaries for the kingdom. Uh, we've, we've got a lot of responsibility in that area and it's been bestowed on us, you know, surely by God's good grace. Uh, the next thing is, is that we are priests. Um, and, and I think this one is an important one to understand that, you know, we don't have to go through a mediator here on earth. We don't have to have, you know, we have direct access to God. We don't have to go to a pastor and say, you know, I, I need you to pray for forgiveness for me. I, that, that's not, that's out of my, that's out of the scope of my biblical job description. I don't have to pray for forgiveness for anybody. I can pray with you, you know, about forgiveness, but I, you know, forgiveness is not mine to give because I need forgiveness just as much as anybody else does, probably more sometimes. But, but, but that's the, the beauty of the gospel is that through Jesus Christ, we can go straight through and we're going to see uh, here later on in chapter one, how Jesus is our high priest, that, that we don't have to go through anybody else. We go, we go straight to him and, and find the forgiveness and the healing uh, that we need. And being a priest, uh, we are ambassadors uh, of God here, here on earth. Uh, so so that's, uh, that's that. And uh, in light of the first eight verses, uh, how does that, uh, how does that apply to us? Um, we give your total adoration of him, give, give God your, your total adoration. And what, what I mean by that, uh, to him who loved us and set us free, you know, glory and honor and praise and, and dominion go to him forever and ever. This is an unceasing, uh, an unceasing thing here. Uh, and the next thing, and this is probably the most important thing, uh, live in anticipation of his return. And we may, uh, yeah, we may stop here before I move on to the next, uh, the next part. But live in, live in anticipation of his return. For 2,000 years, the church has been saying, this is the last days. We, we're in the last days. And I, I believe that. In, in the sense, because, and, and there's there's several ways to look at this, okay? Because the, the book of Hebrews, it says, in these last days, okay? So when Jesus left this earth, that began the last days. And, and, and what I mean by that is that in the church age, Jesus could return at any time without warning. Um, and that that's the thing, you know, Jesus, you know, when I, I made a comment this morning that, that Jesus said, you know, the authority is not mine to give, to sit at my right or left hand. That's not mine to give, okay? There, there's a separation there that Jesus purposely takes away from himself. Jesus doesn't know when, when God's calendar is going to come to completion. He says that, that, the, that even the Son of Man doesn't know the hour at which, uh, you know, which he's supposed to return. So now he sits up on his throne at the right hand of God, interceding on our behalf, uh, making prayers to God on our behalf, and waiting for God to tell him, okay, Jesus, it's time for you to go back. And, and that's what he does. So during that time, he intercedes on our behalf. He, he empowers us here on earth. And, and so, you know, when we do that, we, we need to live in anticipation of his return, that, that Jesus, yes, could come back any moment now. Uh, you know, scripture says over and over, like a thief in the night. You don't know when the thief is going to come. If you did, you'd be up waiting for him, right? And and that that's true to a large extent because if Jesus said, okay, I'm going to come back, and I'm not putting a date on this. I'm just throwing a random date out there. I'm going to come back on December 25th, 2022, okay? So so don't take that to the press and said, my pastor said Jesus is going to return. No, that's not what I'm saying. But, but if we know the date, right, okay, we're going to laze off. You know, we're going to be lazy, you know, and we're going to say, OK, we well, you know I still got, you know, a year and a half. You know, I don't have to do anything now. OK, well, we're getting close now, so I guess I better need to get to work. Right. You know, kind of like, you know, your house sitting for somebody like, oh, they're going to be back at three o'clock. I guess I need to sweep up around here because it's two o'clock. Right. But but Jesus says, 
you don't know the hour. And, and the reason why you don't know the hour is because you need to remain watchful. You need to, and there are signs we need to look for. Um, there, there's a whole, a whole slew of them. Uh, you go into Matthew, uh, 26, I think it is with all of it discourse. Um, but that's going to be outside the scope of, of this, uh, this particular study. But, but Jesus says that there's going to be signs. You're going to hear wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines in various places, you know, things like that. When you see all this, this is just the beginning of birth pains. This is just starting. And, and when you see this, it's going to gradually get worse. And the intensity of it is going to build up. And you're still not going to know when. Like, it's going to get bad. And I believe that's what Jesus is saying here in, in that, that passage. He says, it's going to get bad before I return. You may or may not be here when I return. But you need to keep going as if I was going to return tomorrow. And that's the living in anticipation of his return. Now, I think the modern church, because uh, growing up, I remember talking about this a lot, you know, the return of Jesus, you know, and, and I know, so, you know, if you've been in church longer than me, you probably remember, you know, talking about the return of Jesus a lot more than, than what, what they do now. Um, I don't think, you know, I don't think people like David Jeremiah and, and John Hagee really get enough credit uh, for what they do uh, by studying prophecy. Uh, we need those guys uh, that study the end times and can say, you know, they, they kind of bring us to a sense of urgency, if you will. And I think that's what that's what Jesus was getting at, because if you live in, in anticipation of Jesus coming back at any time, we're going to be busy about what God has called us to do instead of getting spiritually lazy. Um, I used to have a. uh a brigade commander that when we go out on long weekends, they would give us a safety briefing. And he said, so in the process of your decision making, I want you to do this. I want you to give yourself what is called the times test. And he says, basically what I mean is if your actions appeared on the front page of the newspaper on Monday morning, would you be embarrassed? I'm like, that'll make you think about what you're doing. You know, so you know, that, that's one of those things. And I heard a preacher say this a long time ago. Like, if what you're doing at that particular moment, if Jesus came back, would you be embarrassed to be in that position? And I'm like, mm, most positions, yeah, probably. You know, and, and so, you know, there's, you know, there, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot to say about that, that that should fill us with an urgency. Jesus could come back tomorrow. He may not. You know, we, we just don't know. But, but we do know that the situation is gradually going downhill. Well, at least here in, in North America, you know, worldwide, eh, you know, probably not so much because honestly, the, the North American church is the only church in the world that is shrinking. And, and you know, I, I think because there's a, there's a lack of urgency there. And if we thought for one moment that Jesus was going to come back tomorrow, I think the church would completely change its tune. And, and I think we need to, we need to really uh, value that. And, uh, uh, look at that, live in anticipation of, of Jesus's return. Um, so with that, uh, I think we'll stop it right there for the evening. Uh, we'll pick up next week. Uh, next week, we might go through that one pretty quick, uh, verses 9 through 20. Um, if you haven't read the book of Revelation, uh, I would encourage you to read the whole thing, get the context of where it's at. Um, you could read a couple of chapters a night and be through with it by next Sunday. Um, but, but read it. Uh, don't, don't get caught up so much on the details of what, uh, what's going on, but, uh, you know, read it for what it's worth. Uh, if you got any questions, write them down. Uh, and when we get to those chapters, cause next, next week we'll finish up chapter one. Uh, the week after that, probably we'll do chapter two and three together uh, as a as an overview. Uh, questions, concerns. I know that's a lot of introductory material. Digest it. Um, anything I can pray for y'all about this week? Uh, those of y'all that are online, thank you for joining us. Uh, appreciate y'all taking time out of your Sunday. If there's anything I can pray for y'all about, let me know. Uh, and I'll be happy to pray for you, with you, uh, whatever you need. Uh, we'll be happy to get you taken care of. 
Um, nothing. Right, it was pretty, pretty cut and dry. Dora. Okay. Will do. Uh, Mike Gerald, uh, if y'all know him, he's having a procedure done tomorrow. Uh, they're going to try and uh, get a kidney and kidney stone infection cleared up for him. So uh, prayers for a swift recovery. I uh, saw Lonnie was on there earlier. Um, let him know we're praying for him. Uh, if there's anything I can pray for y'all about, uh, please don't hesitate. Don't forget Tuesday. Uh, if you'd like to participate with us, day of fasting and prayer. Um, we'll close the evening out with a prayer meeting. And I uh, hope everybody has a good week. Uh, let's uh, close out in a word of prayer before we uh, dismiss. God, we uh, praise you and we thank you for your word. And Lord, we just uh, we lift up all of our requests to you tonight. Uh, those that are sick, those that are ailing, uh, those that are struggling with uh, whatever emotional issues. Uh, God, I know those can be pretty vicious. And Lord, I uh, just pray for strength and endurance for everybody. And Lord, we just uh, we thank you for your word and the lessons that it brings us. And Lord, we just uh, pray that uh, we can we can hear these truths, that we can apply them in our lives. God, we love you and we thank you. We pray all these things in Jesus name. Amen. Y'all have a good week, everybody.